while the value might be shared between men and women, the burden generally is not. Hi, my name is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching and or listening to a podcast and a live Facebook event called In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And it can be found wherever podcasts are found. And if you like it, please like it in both sense of the word, that you enjoy it, but you also like it on, on, on the interwebs and share it with other people. Today, uh, I'm talking with someone who has a wonderful book that we are going to talk about and does very interesting things with her TEDx talks and all the rest of it. And um, is someone who calls for connection and working with men and women together to give real attention to equality and gender fair issues. Um, Gabriella Schuster is someone who I connected with through the Women's Business Collaborative run by our mutual friend, Edie Fraser, and our friend, uh, Jose Zilstra, who runs a, a, a group that needs no further explanation when you know the name of it. It's just called Gender Fair, and she rates corporations based on how they treat women. And Gabriella has, has um, been someone who's been very much part of that. So Gabriella, first of all, I have a mundane, silly question for you. I got your book online. I got a, a thing. So usually I have a book here to hold up and prove to the author I've read it by showing them how earmarked it is. <laughs> I am not tech savvy enough to start putting stuff up on the screen to prove anything. So my first question to you is, do you have a hard copy of something handy that we can wave around from your end today? Or does it that you can dig up here and do uh, what I would be doing, which is to show the cover and do the artwork. Um, now, let me, let me just say Become Allies is something that we will connect to everywhere this shows. So everyone will be able to get your book. They will be able to go to your website. They will be able to read your bio. But uh, I'm frustrated that I don't have a physical something to hold up. So okay. once in a while, I'm going to tell you to hold it up and and be very cheesy. So and Gabriella, have, first of all, it's just an ebook. That's the thing. I know it's an ebook, but you know, <laughs> ebooks are great. But the the disadvantage is that you know, unless unless you're doing a um, presentation with with you know some kind of electronic input on a thing like this, and it can all pop up on the screen. Ernie, my producer and friend, will do all that later and stick everything in. So, Gabriella, first of all, let me just ask you, when you're not uh, writing uh, and, and producing um, or giving TEDx talks or whatever, day to day, what, what does your day consist of in terms of work? Just describe what you do, because I'd rather have it come from you than me trying to encapsulate what I've read about you. Um, well, so I I read a lot. I, I go and... Um you know, kind of uh, troll different um, publications like the Harvard Business Review. Um, and, um, and I read a lot. I read a lot on LinkedIn and other people's posts and um, try and uh, cult kind of cultivate for people a view of what's going on in the world from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective. And um, my overall goal is helping people to feel empowered themselves to do something. Mm. And, um, and so I try and um, pick out um, things that people should learn about and know um, to kind of motivate them and understand how they have personal power to do something about it. Yeah. So let me, let me dive into some personal weeds here before we get too deep into this. I'm sitting in uh, Massachusetts, just north of Boston. Where, where are you at as we speak? Uh, right now, I'm in Central Coast, California. And when you say right now, does that mean you're visiting somebody or you just move around a lot? I move around a lot. I um, I spend like half the year here and half the year in my house in Seattle. Oh, okay, good. And so are you sort of Seattle-based? Yep. And on a day-to-day -day basis, what do you find yourself doing in Seattle? Let me describe what I do here. When I'm done with this conversation, I'll have a half an hour leeway I will put the focaccia that I have rising in the kitchen in the oven so that when I go pick up my seven and a half year old granddaughter, Nora, I'll have her favorite snack for her. That's what I do. I'm also known as a writer. So let me get personal with you. What do you do besides going around and working on gender equity? I mean, who are you as a person is something I'm always really interested in because I, I think we tend to bury that under sort of career bio stuff, but it's not actually who we are. So how, how would you, you know, I'm a grandfather that takes care of grandchildren. That's kind of what I do. What's your life about? 
Um, so I, well, so I'm a mom. I mean, it's just probably the most important job that I have. I have a, a 19 and a 22 year old, um, and they're both, uh, in school. And, uh, so I spend a lot, I spend multiple times during the day talking to them, probably more than I ever did when they lived with me. Yeah. So. <laughs> Where are they now? Um, my son is in LA and uh, my daughter's back in Seattle. Um, and I'm here in California right now. Uh, what's your son doing in LA? He is going to school at uh, Cal State Northridge studying film. And my daughter is getting her master's degree uh, at Seattle University in uh, exercise physiology. She went oh, to excellent. cardiac rehab. Now, did they, did you sort of raise them in the Seattle area? And then basically, um, so I'm just saying, if your life is like mine until a few minutes ago, what you really did for a living was you were a professional chauffeur. You drove them around. <laughs> well, I mean, so prior so prior to just a few months ago, I was actually a corporate vice president at Microsoft. And yeah, I know that's the official stuff. But in reality, <laughs> but in, you were driving now, your kids yeah, around. I mean, I, a chauffeur, a psychologist, you know, all those things. Um, I also love... Uh, art so I paint the I, I painted this behind me there's artwork all around nice picture house. same here the pictures behind me are all things I painted we, we share a lot yeah so yeah because I uh, the reason I wax personal is this morning I was talking to a very good friend of mine who's a professor at a university who I met when she was at Harvard starting a magazine and then she came to interview me she's a very you know big fancy accomplished woman like you are you know, with all sorts of credentials. We talked for an hour and a half this morning. Um, and what we talked about was the fact that all her friends who are, by the way, in the same sort of demographic age wise and accomplishment wise as you are that, you know, they have this, uh, I'm speaking about women, but men too, they have this official side to their lives, you know, executive at Microsoft, professor at a university doing women's studies and gender equity studies, whatever, as Myrna, my friend does. Um, but really when they talk amongst themselves, they're, doing what all humans do, and that is they're trading notes on love and relationships and children and child care or taking care of an elderly parent. And she was saying the problem is that when they're honest about that side of their life, then there's always some idiot standing there, probably a male, who says, see, we told you, you girls aren't serious people. You, you, you're not going to be able to accomplish anything. Look, look, it, it all comes back to who's pregnant and having children. And of course, that's totally unfair because men also are caregivers and it takes a village. But because of that, like my daughter, who's a CEO of, a, of a, an investment company in New York City, and she's a big fancy lady too, um, she's saying how it is so annoying that a lot of the women she works with feel somehow obligated to almost hide what they care about mm -hmm. outside of work. Ha have you run into any of that? Because having been an executive in Microsoft, I mean, you are in the eye of the storm. In, right. the, in the tech business on top of everything else, which is supposed right. to be so male centric. Can you talk about that a little? Because it's something that I'm really interested in uh, as a writer, but I'm also interested just on a personal basis of doing childcare for my daughter-in-law so she can have a career, which I've been doing for 13 years for grandchildren, put my money where my mouth is in terms of sharing and all the rest of it. My daughter, if there's anybody in America that can address this, it's you. What's your experience with that, of being able to have a whole life or feeling judged all the time when you do? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is very, very hard. Um, you, are, you are judged by like, well, what are you going to put first? What's more important? Um, you know, where, um, and, and well, this, this is just more important, you know, work is always more important than mm. anything else. And, um, and it's a constant kind of uh, internal struggle of, well, I, I'm pretty sure I'm really committed to what I do at work, but it's not the most important thing in my life. The most important mm. thing in my life is raising my children um, and taking care of my parents. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's in, and, and there was a lot of judgment associated with that, um, you know, because, because there, well, well, the value might be shared between men and women, the burden generally is not. Well, certainly traditionally, although I think one of the things that seems to have come out of the COVID pandemic with all these men who were kind of forced to stay home, you know, going to my daughter again, who's my font of knowledge on this issue because she does it every day. During the COVID pandemic, she tweeted me something which I actually included in a book that I was writing later with her permission saying, um, not tweeted me, uh, messaged me something, texted me something. Um, 
saying, I was in a meeting today with the, with the president of a bank and um, I knew nothing about him, but he said, oh, you know, I have to talk quietly because I just put my toddler to sleep. This was from a home Zoom meeting. And she said, until that moment, I didn't even know he had a life. It was always just all business. And, and, and she looked at this moment in time post COVID, well, it isn't post COVID, but you know what I'm saying, yeah. as a kind of a wonderful wake up call where everybody was forced to actually come clean because they're at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and she felt that a lot of the younger men that work for her in her company mm -hmm. are now more uh, apt to say, I'd rather work from home because during this last year, I really discovered that there was a real little person there in my son or my daughter. I wanted to get to know them now. I don't want to go back to the the other thing. So do you think that maybe this period now opens doors for women to be less beholden to these cantankerous old white farts who are my age and, you know, idiots who look at women as if they have something to prove? Are we in a better position, not because of gender equity fighting politically, but just because of the zeitgeist, what's going on out here? I'm hoping. I, you know, I mean, I'm really hoping that you know, the experience that a lot of um, men had when they were at home, realizing how much there was to do, mm -hmm. uh, had, will make a difference and will be a pivot point. And just realizing how much more engaged they want to be will be a pivot point. I definitely think there is a generational thing, mm -hmm. right? I think that um, even like at the, the millennial down level, there is a lot more focus on having a whole life and not just, um, you know, being ambitious and work life um, kind of thing. And so I am hopeful that that makes a difference. I, the thing that makes me less hopeful is all of the statistics that I read yes. about the women dropping out of the workforce as a result of this pandemic, because they realize the same thing. They don't want to go back to mm -hmm. that, rat, that rat race. They want to focus on the things that are important. They realize all the things that they've been missing and they don't want to miss it. Yeah, I've been very informed by the last, say, half dozen um, meetings we've been having on Zoom where I've been very instructed and learned a lot from uh, the WBC, the Women's Business Collaborative, we've had some wonderful speakers on, as you know, who have gone through some of these discouraging numbers, not just the number of women dropping out, but but people who, you know, ob there's the big obvious stuff like a lack of childcare, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, the lack of progress um, when it comes to things like parental leave after a child is born, the fact that even when men are offered this, they sometimes don't take it. So it doesn't give any cover to women who want to because it makes them look less serious. And then sort of weird questions about, well, if you're working from home, are you invisible now? Mm -hmm. So you're not going in and doing all this time in the office and, you know, uh, emailing your boss weekends and everything. So, you know, I, I'm with you. The numbers are discouraging, but I think that some of the solution is in a sense to start really trying also to free men up mm -hmm. to speak their minds more honestly right. and 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 say hey listen you know we we got a bad bargain as women in that we were told to buy into your system but excuse me last time i checked you're not happy either right i mean when when do we get to that stage where it isn't just gender equity it's actually let's change the whole damn system to be in favor of human life period irrespective of gender or, or sexual orientation, how about just start with what is human life about? And it's certainly not all about career and job and title. And, and then in a minute, I'm going to ask you about Microsoft and your rise there and what you faced and what you did. But just let's talk a little more about this before we get into that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm with you. I think that um, it's being, it's recognizing the things that are important and, and helping you prioritize your life and set boundaries around your life and, um, and to manage to those boundaries and to, to realize, actually, I think that um, you can be successful 
um, having a whole life. You actually, you're happier. And yeah. when you're happier, you're more productive. And, um, and you, like, if you, if you set out and said, like, oh, I'm going to have to work late tonight, you actually are less productive all day because you know you had these extra few hours you're going to work at night. Um, if you set out and say, like, oh, I've got to get everything done today at five, you know, in seven hours because I have something else I have to go do, you are way more productive in that day. And so it's it's really helping people understand how they just manage all of the different priorities that they have and um, and say no. Like just, it's just helping everybody be more human, um, be more, um, help themselves understand their own limitations and know mm. we all have them. There's a lot in all sorts of religions, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Evangelical Protestant, that is weighted against the full participation of women mm -hmm. because we bring with us this kind of prehistoric bias against equality. Yeah. And I, I grew up and I was going to use a bad word, so now I'll treat you with it. And the way I describe myself as someone who is, was, was basically groomed to be, become an asshole by divine right. In other words, God wants you to push women around and be in charge. This was part of the teaching I was raised with. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, 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 it come, came very close to smashing my relationship with my wife, Jeannie, which was repaired when I began to rethink all of this stuff. And so for me, the journey away from that theology was also a journey towards looking at, at relationships as really equal partnerships. Yep. Um, and so, you know, what, what, the reason I talk about that is I think that, again, you know, have we arrived at a place where, where men and women can both be honest about the fact they have families or older parents? Um, you know, as my daughter puts it, uh, who I mentioned before is a CEO of a company in New York, you know, have we arrived at a place where I can be honest in my, in my uh, bio and actually put in there, I'm talking my daughter Jessica now, that what I learned from raising two children is actually far more important than anything I learned in the business community about how to be an effective CEO. Yeah. And she's begun to include that now in her stuff. And she says, some people really don't like it, including some women who sort of pick up on the vibe you were talking about before where, hey, we gotta be more serious than that, as if somehow that's a, it's a problem. So let's just talk about that for a minute. Then let's dive into your book, Become Allies. And let's talk about your time at Microsoft. Yeah, no, I mean, so I, I uh, 100 percent agree with you. I mean, I'm I'm Jewish, and in Judaism, if you're an Orthodox Jew, like the women don't count. Like right. they they don't they you know they they are supposed to be in a different room than you. Um, they're supposed to be ten people to pray for a quorum and. If, if it's women, they don't count in that number 10. I mean, like there's a number of ways that like women are completely dismissed through, um, through religion. And, um, and it, it's, it is endemic all around the world in all different cultures and all different religions. And it, it's something that we need to um, break through right as we try and drive for um equity and and also there are women all around the world who do unpaid work that is incredibly important to society and yeah. not recognized at all and um and it, it is though when we can start to recognize that and value that for what it is and get past a lot of the bias that's just built into everything um then it will enable us to make change, but, but it is exactly that. I mean, I'm reading this book, Invisible Woman. It's an amazing book. It talks about how the default assumption is that the experience of men is universal. That it, and, and so we miss so much in the way we design things and the way we do things um, in the data we look at, because we don't look at it between men and women and their experiences. We just assume that the experience we're looking at is a universal experience, but it's a man, a male experience. And so, yes. you know, it's just, um, it's very depressing. Um, but it, but it, you know, it, it also as the optimist in me says like that we can make this change. We can break yeah. through. There are, there are cultures where that is less so the case. Yes. Well, when you look, for instance, at Iceland or Switzerland, right. 
some of the Scandinavian countries that have more gender equity and not top down, bottom up. Uh, yep. It isn't just because they had a legislative agenda from a left wing socialist, blah, 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 but it's real. Uh, the weird thing is the actuarial tables balance out and men live as long almost statistically as women do. They do better on, on just the most measurable statistic of all, which is, are you alive? Right. Uh, in, in America, men die seven to seven and a half years sooner than women do on average. In Iceland, it's almost parity within months. OK, the only difference in these cultures is, is that, that in Iceland, you have a, a culture in which gender parity is assumed. Right. including, for instance, and this means a lot to me, having gotten my girlfriend Jeannie pregnant when we were 17 and 18, and we're still together, by the way, all this half century later, all just luck, by the way, um, and, and because I changed a little bit. But the, the fact of the matter is, when you look at these issues, um, I think, if I may, that, that the, 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 the rise of feminism in the largest sense of the word uh, is really an evolutionary step that has to do with the survival of the species. You know, I, 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 it's not a coincidence that Vladimir Putin is a man. It's not a coincidence that Bolsonaro of, of Brazil is a man. It's not a coincidence that the bumptious sort of toxic male continues to run our planet into the ground. And that uh, it seems to me that, you know, we have a shot here to learn from women, to put them in charge of a lot. And you know, we, we may all get to where uh, you, you know, the, the, the planet can be redeemed and we can survive. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. I don't think this is just an issue of fairness. I think it goes far, far, far beyond that. I think it's really a question of human survival. And that's because I think we all evolve male and female primarily as caregivers. You, know, you and I aren't talking today because of some clever business decision somebody made 50 years ago. We're talking today because someone in your family tree and in my family tree cared for an ancestor of ours and didn't leave them by the wayside and we're still here. Right. So in that sense, we're all each other's parents and, uh, and, and that's gotta be the vision. So now how does that translate into your book, uh, Become Allies? Let's, let's switch from uh, our philosoph philosophy discussion here to what you've done in this book. Tell me about the book and what's in it. And then I'll ask you some questions based on having looked through it myself. Yeah, I mean, and so, you know, when I, when I think about what makes a difference for somebody, how do you, how do you personally um, make a difference? Mm. Um, and what made a difference for me? And this is, this is why, you know, I, I, I started down this path because I got frustrated that 30 years into working in high tech, things are not better for women. Mm. And, um, and in fact, in some cases, they're a lot worse. And, you know, how do we really change that? And, what, what did I do? What were the tactics I used to, you know, be successful? And I started to kind of dissect that. And what I realized is that I had kind of um, unconsciously been building allies through my career and, um, and enlisting men to, um, to support me. Like, so that if somebody was talking over me, I wasn't the only one noticing that someone was talking over me. Um, or if somebody was taking, you know, taking my idea and like, then it was hailed as brilliant. I wasn't the only one that noticed that that just happened. And, um, and so I thought, well, you know what, how do I turn this into something that helps others understand how to, be that ally and help women um, and actually anyone understand how to build those allies, how to ask for what you want, and then how to um, be there um, as an ally. So the, the definition of an ally is somebody who um, recognizes their own power, um, privilege, position, and shares that power with someone else. So by doing that, they empower somebody else. And, um, and so, you know, that was, that was where I found that, that individuals, every individual, regardless of, you know, whether you're talking about work or not work, um, whether you're talking about whatever position you have in an organization, you have the opportunity to be empowered and be an ally. And you have to do it much more intentionally, though. Mm -hmm. You have to be thinking about it. And, um, and if you want to create diversity in your organization, you have to do that intentionally. You have to think about it. Because if you don't think about it, then what you do is you end up 
hiring people in your own circle. You hire people who are your friends and your family or are recommended by somebody else that you know. And typically that does not drive diversity. And so, um, you know, I started to explore like, how do I help people make more conscious patterns of behavior that are easy to remember, easy to do, um, and empowers everybody to start making that change. Hmm. Yeah, no, I really like that about the book. And now I'm going to just question you a little bit on that. Can you give me some specific examples of other people who have experienced the same phenomena of making these connections? And then as part B to that question, the allies you were making, how did they fall out between male and female and non-binary people and so forth? Was it mostly women? Was it mostly men? Examples from your book, maybe examples from other people's lives where this is work, because I think it's a tremendous principle. I just want to know more about it. Yeah, I mean, so for me, because I was surrounded by men, it was mostly men, but um, but uh, there were women that were my allies as well. And um, and I don't think that the process and the approach is any different um, mm. when you are uh, building an ally with a woman than you're building an ally with a man. Um, it is a, a, it is about, um, you know, r recognizing that you you are you are alone, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you are, if you are in a meeting, in a group, and you are feeling like you don't belong, like mm -hmm. um, your perspective doesn't matter, that someone doesn't want to hear it, or like you're uncomfortable because your perspective is so different. Mm -hmm. um, the, the key thing is to recognize like that difference is good. That difference is necessary. That's what diversity is about. And that's mm -hmm. why you're there. Um, but you've got to figure out how can you um, enlist the support of those around you to make it easier for you to step into that. Hmm. Um, and, um, and building allies is the way to do that, to, um, you know, uh, be able to be clear with people about what you need. I, I find that, um, you know, 80, 90 percent of the men that I work with um, wanted to be supportive, to be allies, to empower me, um, but they didn't know what to do. And so the clearer I could be about what I needed, um, then they could take action. And talk, talk about some of the things that you did need in your own journey and what other women in similar positions or coming to those positions might need, sort of specifically the kind of things that they were not seeing that yep. you had to draw to their attention because they had goodwill. And you said, hey, Jim, next time around fill in the blank what could what could we do better yeah so um so there's the most the most um frequent microaggression is um is being interrupted hmm. right uh con i was constantly being interrupted i would have an idea i would start to talk about it and i would be interrupted and um it's frustrating because you get interrupted so so much that you just decide to stop talking and um, and that's not just my experience. That's that's like you know I, as I've talked to other women, that is a large swath of, um, of frustration. And so being able to say to someone that you're that you want to be your ally, um, you know, when that happens, it would be helpful if you would simply say, "I don't know that Gabriella was done talking." What else did you want to say? Or are you done? Would you like mm -hmm. to finish? Whatever it is, right? <clears throat> and it's a way of, you know, interrupting that flow without creating any kind of blaming or shaming, right? You just interrupt the flow and you give the floor back. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's super powerful because then the person who did interrupt realizes, oh, I just interrupted. Because a lot of times they don't recognize that mm -hmm. they that right um and when you ask somebody to do that they pay more attention right then they recognize that you're getting interrupted a lot and um and they start to see that and then they start to see it not just for you but for everyone mm -hmm. right um and so another another one is um you know that you, you say something and nobody hears it like it's not it's not like made a focal point um but then like three minutes later, a guy says it and it's hailed as a brilliant idea, right? And, um, and so the way I built out an ally with that is I said, look, you know, I 
feel like this happens to me a lot, at least like once every meeting, I'll say something, no one responds to it. Um, it's as if I didn't say it. And then three minutes later, someone else says it and they think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking to be a credit hound, right? I just would like to be part of the conversation. So when that happens, it would be helpful if you said something like, um, hey, Brad, that's, that's a great idea. And I think Gabriella said something like that just a couple minutes ago. Gabriella, is there more that you'd like to expand on that? Right? Yeah, I, lo I love those points. Um, let's just switch gears for a minute here because people will be very frustrated otherwise um, and talk about, brag for five minutes here to me about your rise in, in a tech industry. Talk about where you are, uh, what you've achieved and so on, because I just want to uh, go there for a minute. Uh, you know, you, you're in Microsoft. Talk about your history with Microsoft and what you've done there, and and lay it out for us so we know that little part of you, uh, as well as all this the other material. Sure. So, um, so I I worked in high tech for over 30 years. I worked at Microsoft for 26. Um, I was I had 14 different roles um, in those 26 years. Um, I started Microsoft in 1995 during a very formative time of the company, and, um, and I was able to cross um, from operations into enterprise sales into services. I did some merger and acquisition work. I did product management work, product planning work. So I, I worked in a lot of different parts of the organization. Um, the last job I had is I was the corporate vice president for um, Microsoft's partner ecosystem. It's about 300,000 IT organizations around the world. Um, and I was running um, revenue of about $42 billion. And um, so it, you know, it was, um, it was a great career. Um, and, um, and I, um, you know, I was, I was promoted a lot during the course of my career. Um, and I also did take a step back um, when I had my second child and I worked part-time for about three and a half years. Um, and, uh, and I learned a lot about um, why I shouldn't have done that also. Um, although I would never, I mean, I never would take it back. I, I, I don't regret it at all, but I, but I realized I did that because it was the only way I felt like I could justify um, not working 60 hours a week. And, um, and, you know, I told people who worked for me after that, like, if you want to work part-time, I will figure out how to make that happen. But um, you can feel free to work 35 hours a week and still be paid for your full time mm -hmm. uh, because you will be more productive when, um, when you set boundaries, like we talked about earlier. Well, and obviously it, this would be just as welcome to a lot of your male counterparts if yeah. they had that opportunity and knew that they weren't going to get dinned for it. Like a lot of these guys who don't take paternity leave thinking, well, I won't look as serious. And then the women are sitting there saying, well, thanks for nothing, because now it makes me look unserious and I want to take this time. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a horrible circle that has to be broken, I think. And uh, let me ask you about going, going through your career path here. Um, sort of, you brought us up to speed on where you come from. A as we speak today, um, what is your job description? Uh, how would you see yourself? I mean, aside from the fact you've written this book and you're an advocate for these issues, are you still working for in within the corporate structure? Yeah, well, so now I'm um, an executive board director. So um, I work on the board of um, several organizations and then I work with private equity firms in helping them evaluate uh, technology investments that they're making. Oh, okay, good. Well, um, you know, as I mentioned, my daughter, Jessica, she's also part of WBC. We ought to, you ought to talk with her because she's, she uh, is working uh, as a green energy person, both for the investment side. And before that, she was a lobbyist for the 50 biggest um, European energy companies with the European Union with her office in Brussels. And then she moved here to the CEO position. So Je uh, Jessica's involved with uh, the WBC, the Women's Business Collaborative and our friend. Uh, so there's connections there. I think she was done. Were you at the stock exchange the other day when no, I couldn't get out to New York. I couldn't get there either. But anyway, they all seem to be um, having a good time down there. L let me get back to uh, your book in that um, I'm going to, obviously we're recommending it highly and asking people to buy it 
uh, and uh, it, it, we will put all the links there. But in terms of who your reader is, you know, when I write, I start sort of picturing a reader. Uh, who are the kind of people, male, female, non-binary, whomever, um, who will benefit from the book on a personal level of giving them more steps of things they can do? And then on the corporate level of saying, hey, we ought to make sure every everybody reads this book so that uh, Gabriella has an impact on our company beyond just individual activity uh, and, and make a little more corporate policy out of it. Is there anything that you could, you're doing to kind of get people in other corporations that are perhaps less friendly to their women employees and less helpful in terms of becoming their allies to read this? Is, uh, what, what, what sort of things are you doing to promote this book and who to, to whom? And who do you picture as your reader? Is it a vice president of a company that hasn't thought of this or the, or the woman working for him who's a little bit oppressed by his lack of help and insensitivity? Well, so um, in general, I believe that there's a 20% there's a of the population who recognizes that there are, um, that these challenges exist, not just for women, but for blacks, for LGBTQ, for um, a lot of the minority populations at work. Mm -hmm. And um, and they wanna do something and they don't know what to do. Um, and so in general, that is the audience that I wrote this for. Somebody who recognizes there's an issue, but they wanna figure out what do they do about it. Um, specifically, um, I wrote this for, um, one of my my last job was advising these organizations around the world, tech organizations around the world, and how they um, create higher degree of profitability and revenue for their organization, and how mm -hmm. they increase cash flow, and creating a more diverse and inclusive environment um, is a proven technique to drive greater degrees of innovation and higher profitability. Mm -hmm. And so specifically, I wrote this for the CEOs of those organizations, which tend to be kind of mid-size, you know, say 200 to 500 people. And for the leadership of those organizations to understand, how do you build a more diverse organization and break out of the way that you've done it in the past? And then how do you make sure that your organization is working in an inclusive way. Yeah, you know, I, I, just coincidentally, Ernie's reminding me in my notes, Ernie, my producer, that it's equal pay day today. And in terms of making allies, uh, you know, you get these sort of token days. It's like Valentine's Day. You know, if you have to depend on Valentine's Day to say, I love you to somebody, you got a problem, you know, like anniversaries and all this. It's just tokenism. But other than the fact that equal pay day, you know, serves as a nice token gesture, Let's talk for a minute about gender equity in the most basic form of equal pay and opportunity, aside from making the alliances you're talking about once you're sort of in the system. Um, you, you know, when we look at that in, in the United States, it seems that along with infrastructure and all sorts of other things, we, we tend to lag behind a lot of other developed countries in our sensitivity towards this. I had an example of this on a, on a, on a women's business collaborative call where there was an executive, I think from Daimler-Benz um, in Germany. I think that's who she was working for. I'm afraid my, her name slipped my mind. But I, I asked in the chat section a question saying, well, how many of the people who are in corporations on this call are in a company that provides childcare on the premises of your factories and offices so that a mother or a father a parent of any kind can be at work and go have lunch with their kid in the, in the center, or there can be a crisis and they can go down the hall, forget just working from home. Right. And I was stunned by the fact that she held her and she answered me and said something to the effect that, um, and I remember the number, it was mind boggling. She says, well, we have 900 of them. This was a big company and it's a German company. And I'm thinking, well, you know, why don't you hear about more American corporations who are doing, you know, we hear about like sort of lactation rooms or we hear about pumping places for mothers to do breast milk and all this kind of stuff, or, you know, maybe they should pay for day daycare. But what about sort of no brainer, good stuff like big corporations just having childcare on the premises, top quality Montessori type stuff so that parents of all genders can just relax and, and know their child is cared for and it's part of the package. You, you know, do, can we get into stuff like that on equal pay day or are we still just talking about 70 cents on the dollar? Well, so 70 cents on the dollar is probably the most urgent and pressing issue of the yeah. day on that. Um, but I would say that um, 
The challenge I think we have in the US is that uh, the, there is a culture of litigation and there's a level of liability that, that people hold accountable that doesn't exist in a lot of other countries. Yeah. And, um, and it prevents organizations from doing a lot of things for people like having on-site childcare because the level of liability associated with that is pretty high. Is um, yeah. and, um, and so it's, it's frustrating. Right, um, because it doesn't open up all the doors, um, and it really uh, keeps it. You know, even even equal pay is held back by a lot of um, the 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 potential for organizations to have greater litigation. Um, so, from from my perspective, one of the biggest things that we could do that would drive for um, pay equity and greater diversity is to um, insist that organizations be transparent about their current, um, you know, yeah. where they stand, pay equity and diverse um, populations. And, um, and the reason organizations don't want to do that is because if they don't have, um, if they haven't already taken action to drive for pay equity, then they open themselves up for lawsuits, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's this litigation culture that overrides everything that makes it so hard for us to make progress on so many of these issues. Well, when we get, when we talk about these issues, let me dive back into your own career and talk about, you know, what is the state of the union in tech these days for women and for people of color and just across the, the whole gamut of diversity issues and equality and fairness, uh, you know, the tech industry I'm not particularly fond of the tech industry. I mean, I use it, here we are, you know, we're doing this together on Zoom here and we're gonna put it on Facebook. And so there's a huge level of hypocrisy in my comments, but I, I get very annoyed by the hubris of um, the tech industry anyway, and the malfeasance of people like Facebook and just the, you know, the whole bit. I mean, it's very annoying and it's, it's talking, speaking now as a male, you know, it's the kind the, the kind of men who come up with things, uh, you know, in tech sometimes are the sorts of men that annoy me most anyway, uh, in terms of all these stupid catchphrases like disruption and everything. And I'm always sort of saying, well, disrupt what? What I love most in my life are the undisrupted bits. Thank you very much. You know, <laughs> take your disruption and shove it. Uh, I want to go back to an old restaurant I've loved for years and I still want to find it there. You know, I don't want to find a parking garage because you had a better idea. Thank you. So that's my personal bias, aesthetic, I guess. But give me a little thumbnail sketch of the State of the Union. Is it getting better in tech for women or not? You talked a minute ago about the fact it's still very frustrating. Um, are, you the, are you the exception that proves the rule? Uh, or are other people being able to come up through this and on the science -y side as well as the management side? So... Um... High tech is definitely the worst. Like, uh, you know, when you look at other areas of STEM, um, when you look at um, scientists, mathematicians, there is closer to say 40% women, 60% men. High tech has gone backwards. So when I first uh, started working in high tech in 1991, 36% um, of the computer workforce was women. And today it's down to 24%. And, um, and so it is definitely going backwards um, in terms of the level of diversity. And, you know, like, uh, don't even get me started on, um, you know, Black, African American, Hispanic, Latino um, workers in high tech. It's very low. Um, and uh, those organizations are pre predominantly um, white men. And, um, you know, there, we really need to do much more intentional work to um, bring about higher levels of equity. I mean, you know, people, um, organizations get excited when they have a, say, 25 or 30% women in, in, you know, in the organization or, you know, 15% women in leadership, you know, it, it, it's like, Wow, that's like pathetic. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, the, the bro culture still exists in high tech. There's a lot of systemic challenges. Um, and the, you know, there's that 
there is that perspective that you work 24 hours a day, great ideas, they come to you at 10 o'clock at night, or, you know, if you're not, you know, working to burn out, then, um, then you're not working hard enough. And the, all of those things still persist mm. in, um, in the, in the high tech industry. And, um, and it's very frustrating. The, the number of women who have, um, patents is way lower than the number of men. Um, women who get um, VC and private equity funding for their organizations, typically the numbers only go up when they are um, co-founded with a male, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's still startlingly bad. You know, it, it seems to me, uh, and, and I'm not trying to um you know, make you agree with me, please disagree if I'm wrong here. But as an outside observer of the tech industry and the kind of people I've known, uh, and I know this is very dodgy ground to get into, but you have a level of insensitivity that almost seems to put some of these males on some sort of mental health spectrum, as in literally don't know how to react to other human beings. They may be very bright in this little one area, but man alive, uh, they're tough people to get on with. And they seem to have a, a, an empathy deficit across the board. Um, you know, and you look at the, the guys who have made the most money building their own rockets and stuff, you, you really kind of wonder in terms of lifestyle choices. And then the other thing I want to throw out is, is to you uh, to comment on kind of a philosophical point. I, I don't think it's an accident that for the last 30 years of the ascendancy is tech, of tech as we now understand it, um, that authors like Ayn Rand who have glorified the dominant uh, male success story of somehow, you know, the great leader and all should bow before them. You know, something that captured this very well was this movie, Don't Look Up, uh, where, um, you know, you have this tech chief and somebody says, calls him a businessman. He says, I'm not a businessman, I'm evolution. You know, like somehow I'm above just being a businessman. I'm, I'm the cutting edge of where the human race is going. And that kind of ridiculous hubris sort of goes with this Ayn Randian view of the great male leader, you know, just what you're talking about works 24 seven leads, the hubris, the kind of toxic male and so on. And I'm wondering if, does the tech industry draw a certain type of male to it? Do they become that way within it? Does getting successful make you this greedy and crazy? Because when you look for instance at universities today, there are more women in uni university level education than there are males. It's not because women are not educated. Um, it isn't because there are none in the sciences. Uh, I almost wonder if there's not a philosophical bias within the, the community itself towards a kind of a libertarian male uh, orientation that is less to do with business models and more almost philosophical, almost religious in a sense of, of regarding a certain type of success. I don't know, maybe I, I'm not putting this well, but, but yeah, does no, it spark I mean, any I thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, there are there are a lot of women who, you know, study to go into high tech, they, you know, they they do go in, and the dropout rate is very high. Um, and it is because, um, you know, you, you tend to hit, um, you know, a lot of these kind of systemic built in biases, like, um, well, you know, you if you're, if you're going to be a uh, developer and gaming, then um, you have to be doing gaming all the time. And mm -hmm. like the best gaming games are the ones where you go around killing people all the time. Right. And so if you don't like that, then you don't belong here. Um, and there, there is, um, it's very, it does tend to be very clubby. I mean, organizations like Microsoft have tried to evolve over time, right? Like it, it was say like 10 years ago, like it was yeah. like well, Microsoft, we only hire the smartest people. And, and, and so when you look at like the way that the hiring was done, it was all very um, biased towards hiring men. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot of work done to, you know, kind of move away from that and talk about, you know, um, growth mindset, empathy, collaboration. Those are things that one, attract more women and two, create a, a more inclusive organization that embraces um, the qualities that women tend to bring to the organization. Um, but, but still within the industry, there's 
there's still too much of that perspective that, you know, it's, it's based on moments of brilliance and, um, and your level of passion for it. And it has to be like, you're overriding um, thoughts all the time. And those are not typically characteristics that women like aspire to. They don't. Yeah, which is which. By the way, at, at being at risk of being one of those males that jumps in and interrupts you is precisely why women actually get things done, and a lot of men, it's just talk. I mean, I'm being serious. I'm not pandering to your point of view. I really mean it. It's why I have a woman doctor, a woman lawyer, a woman estate planner, a woman financial planner. I'm married to Jeannie for all these years and changed so she'd stay married to me. You know what I'm saying? Because it was my, there were my problems. I think there are men out there like me who are genuine allies, not based on some ideology where we, you know, accepted Jesus and decided to change our lives, but just on a utilitarian basis of what works. And what works in this life is cooperation. We did not survive as a species because of biff, bam, boom, get out there and conquer everything. It's because of all the little acts of collaboration. Let me just say that on um, this podcast and this thing, uh, Frank Schaefer, in conversation with Frank Schaefer, that we have very intentionally are working to make the podcast guest list equally split. It really split, not, hey, we have 15% women guests and we're doing the same thing on with people of color, black leaders, black authors and others. And we've worked very hard at it. And so far we have achieved that. It's a 50-50 split exactly in our guest list. Uh, and, and okay, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I'm saying we are working at it. By way of also saying to women who watch this and our friends at the WBC that we are trying to reach out to talk with more Gavriellas, if I can put it that way. We really want to do your story. We really care about it. I'd say the main theme of our podcast is gender equity in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do that with men. By the way, one of the guests I had that I want to bring to your attention just for your own reading list was Matthew Barzan, speaking of one of our male guests. And Matt is a friend of mine who was um, Barack Obama's ambassador to the UK and then was Barack Obama's chief fundraising person for the small donation program that gave him the money that made him president. And Matt has written this incredible book that I interviewed him on our podcast about called The Power of Giving Away Power. And you were talking in a way 20 minutes ago that could have been taken out of Matt's book in terms of exactly that. So I would recommend The Power of Giving Away Power as something that you would enjoy reading. If you ever wanna get in touch with Matt, I'll introduce you because you're speaking the same language um, and, and, and it, it's a really good point. So you're, you, you know, there are other very smart, wonderful people out there saying something similar to what you're saying, which I think is always a good sign. So let, let me get back to um, this question of your own journey through tech. Um, what can be done by people to try to get to a point where the tech industry is known for more than being a bro culture? Is that gonna change? Is it gonna change because of social pressure or can we be like our friends at Gender Fair, Jose Zilstra, my friend who got me involved with ED and WBC, who I've interviewed here, who rates companies by the way women are treated within those corporations. I don't know if Jose is rating tech companies because it's more on the consumer end of things, but let's start this with something positive. Is there a tech company that's sort of doing it right and has really a 50-50 split yet and is really working to have black and pe uh, people of color and, and uh, you know, other folks who have been neglected or are they all just a big mess? I don't, I haven't run across a tech company that um, is at a 50, 50 split. Um, and, you know, has, uh, there are a lot of companies in the tech industry that are driving towards pay equity, which is super important, um, and have programs to drive for um, pay equity. There How about are, transparency, just to throw that one in, because you brought it up. Um, there are a few, yeah. I mean, Microsoft in particular has um, published um, the, um, their pay equity stance um, and, uh, and the data behind it, as well as their diversity numbers. And so, you know, there is movement afoot to do that. Um, AWS has a uh, male allies program in place um, led by a friend of mine, Robert Lascano, um, and has over 1,500 um, people who, men, who are participating in that allyship program. And so there, there are, 
definitely there's movement afoot, um, you know, in, in the um, circles of the partners that I work with, the, the IT organizations around the world. Um, there is a lot of interest in figuring out how they get uh, do better hiring to drive for diversity. So this is the moment, like this is the moment where I do think that we can turn the tide and, and make that change. And I think that the opportunity, the biggest opportunity in tech is to focus on emerging technology areas like artificial intelligence, like cybersecurity, where there isn't, you know, a swath, of, like there's a talent gap in the market, there's not enough people, the way that you're going to get more people is you're going to actually look across the spectrum of people who are eligible. And, um, and there aren't people who have 20 years of experience in any of that. And so mm -hmm. You, you know, you are you are looking at a more level playing field um, to go out and get to that 50 50 um, stance on that. Yeah, and it seems to me that it's not a coincidence that the major whistleblower about Facebook and some of the things they've done that have really been quite awful in terms of targeting children and others is a woman and was able to back up what she said with a lot of verifiable facts, you know. I mean, one reason we want women in tech is because women seem to have a more acute moral consciousness when it comes to the societal impact of something we do. You know, this would be a better, safer, healthier, less polluted planet if it wasn't all about greed and toxic male hubris and achievement. If somebody stopped for a minute and said, hey, we can do this, should we do this? The women in, in my life, like my doctor, who sometimes says to me, we could do this, but should we? Would it really be the best thing for you? Um, you know, the male is always, hey, you know, we'll cut tomorrow morning and get this thing done and biff, bam, boom. I, I, again, I think that the, 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 the female vision is not a softer one. It is one based more on what is the effect of what I'm doing to other people and to the planet. And we could do with a lot more of that. And I think the whistleblower at Facebook is an example of that. Be before we wrap this up, let's talk a little more about how people can get your book and use it. We're going to post it everywhere. It, 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 I, I'm sorry, I don't have the book right in front of me, but the the um, the subtitle that you would give it, it become becoming al become allies. Uh, what's the subtitle? We're going to give links to all of this, but it's, how it's would you say? It's a framework for change. That's it. It's a framework for change. I screw these things up so badly, even in the titles of my own book, that my producer has to put them up as memos to me saying, here's the title of your last book. I mean, I'm sorry. No, uh, it's it's free. So you don't have to buy it. It's free. You can go to gabriellaschuster.com. Yeah. Um, and download it. And, um, and I would encourage you to, you know, take a look, think about how do you apply that in your own life? What's the opportunity for you to um, yeah. both uh, change your hiring practices to hire for diversity and then create a more inclusive environment so that you celebrate that diversity? Are you allowing other people to post your book as well? Not taking credit for it, but as a book, since it is free and no one's stealing from you, for instance, could we put it on all our sites? Yes, absolutely. And not just a link to your site, but the book. Yeah, it's fine. So it's one click. So Ernie, my producer, you're listening to this. I want Gabriella's book stuck up as a guest uh, commentary on my blog site. I want to put it on Facebook. I want to put it on um, Twitter and all our sites and make it like one click so that they can go straight to Gabriella's book. Let's, let's start something for her try to spread the word. And then of course, put a button for people to click back to her for information or speaking or whatever else. And what else, what else can we do for you? Uh, you know, that the biggest, the biggest thing was for me would be just to get this out there and have people start to adopt it and take action. If we could get to the place where we have um, male allies in every organization in the way that AWS has intentionally created this group for male, male allies, mm -hmm. that would be a dream because the more that um, men and women are out there actively and intentionally trying to be allies, um, the more inclusive we create um, the environment and the more likely we are to have people feel like they belong and they're valued. Well, one thing we can do is put it on all our sites with all the links to it. And Ernie is good at this. Um, Ernie, also think about sending the book, not a link to it, but the book since it's free. We can spread it around. Uh, let's send it to all our past and present guests to read and recommend that they do because some of those are people of influence and we'll do everything we can. Gabriella, I really believe in what you're doing. Thank you. 
I appreciate that. This yeah, please. And do come back and talk more about your your work and, and all of these important things that also keep us posted on what's going on. And by the way, Gabriella, if you have, if you're saying, well, you know, this was an interesting interview, um, I'm looking for more women to talk to. If there's a woman out there that I don't know about who has something to say, and they don't have to be, a, you know, huge, whatever, just any anything that needs saying that isn't getting heard enough, you know my producer, Ernie, because we set this up together, please link us up, say, hey, Anne, you need to meet Frank and send an email to Ernie and to me and get us together and tell us what she can bring to the table because we not only want to keep going 50-50, we can tilt it more towards the voices that aren't heard, uh, please, because so many people are in touch with you, pass on some good connections of, of women who have something to say that we can talk to and help okay. get what they're doing more visible to the extent that, that we can. So that would be a big favor you could do for us if you would. And I would just say that to any woman listening to this, if you have something to say, or you're working with women who do, you know, we're talking about allies, you're looking at one. I got it, it took a long road to get here. I have a book about it called Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. It's in bookstores everywhere, blah, blah, blah. But it's about this balance of life and relationships to work and career in a way that I think, and many women think who have read it is very, favorable toward the needs of women and community and diversity. So I hope that folks look at that book as well and get in touch with us if you have ideas on guests for this for this uh, podcast and this this thing, because we really are trying to do our bet. So it's very sincere. Awesome. Love it. So Gabriella, thank you very much. And, and stay in touch with us. Let me know if we can do more. We will do everything we can to spread the word on the book. Amazing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.